decided to do that. <laughs> hello, hello. Hey, hi, hello, welcome. If you're watching the replay, thank you so much. I hit the thumbs up, I appreciate you. Um, but welcome to the discussion of hood feminism. I'm sorry my voice sounds like this. I feel like moderate hot garbage today, which is progress. <laughs> so I may be a little more quiet, but um, so happy to see familiar faces here in the chat. We may, we're supposed to be joined by Brie from Locked Booktician, so I don't know if she might pop in here. Monet also may pop in. So, so many, yes. I know, I have, I have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like uh, on Parks and Rec when she goes to talk to the radio station people and they talk really quiet and they play two multiple jazz albums over each other. Oh my God. That's what I was thinking. I was like, Jess is sounding like smooth as AF. Like this is <laughs> NPR. Yeah, this is her NPR ASMR voice. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a... Uh, Phoebe getting sick and her voice all of a sudden sounds. I just woke up. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, worries. <laughs> no worries. Well, now I feel better about my smooth jazz. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? All star lineup. And breathe. And breathe. I'm so sorry, y'all. I was not <laughs> out. You hear me? I was. So I was. I was important. up. I was up watching a new British uh, TV show with my friend Grandma. We were having a good time. It was me and her chilling. My bad. What time is it? It's, it's 10 a.m. I realize I'm ashy. I'm going to go get a little lotion. I can't do this. I love it. I love it. You know um, what? It, we're very casual. I've got my coffee. Bree's yes. getting lotion. Jess has her jazz voice. Elle is a treat and woke up at eight for us. Like I feel like this is just a, a lovely a vibe. I feel like we've got like a very We're get ready with really us in the morning the content vibe. of this book. <laughs> <laughs> I did put on pants. I was walking around like, where are my pants? They were in the dryer. So even though you can't yeah. see down there, I was like, what if I get up to go to the bathroom or something? Yeah. Yeah, don't be like me. One time I got up during the live, I had on my underwear and I, I had to delete the whole live. Oh so, yeah. I had to get up out of there. Yeah. I yesterday I was I forgot my like the change of clothes I had to take a shower and I forgot that I had my curtains open. So my neighbors got a full treat. Um just the full Full kit and caboodle. I hope that they were not looking my way because they were definitely out on their porch where they could see me. Well, you know, Ooh, Christmas another, came early. God bless. Another eight o'clock person. Good hey. morning. Good morning. Well, if you all would like to introduce yourself, you know, shout out your channel, whatever. And then you can also say like um, what you rated the book. And in the chat, also let me know what you gave, what you thought about the book, if you rated it. Nice. Um, I'm Angela. I'm here every time. Literature Science Alliance. <laughs> to talk about books. I don't know. Um, what did I rate it? I don't know how to rate this one because I think we're going to discuss like I think it depends on what you come into this book for. Like, I don't know. In terms of the project of the book, maybe a four, four and a half star. In terms of what I got from it, it's fine. It's totally fine. I don't regret reading it. That sort of rating. <laughs> so, I'm Elle from the channel Elliot Brooks. And I don't really rate books. I especially have a hard time rating nonfiction, but I think I feel similarly to Angela in that my own personal, I guess what I got out of this book was more just almost talking to a friend who you agree with a lot about a lot of things. But as far as nonfiction goes, I maybe wanted some, some of it to go a little bit further. And I'm sure we'll chat about that here. I'm Mara from Books Like Woe. I was on the inaugural uh, Books and Communa Books and Communa Read. I don't know. Book Communa Read? You came Sorry, up with Sorry. the title. I did. I named this, so I <laughs> think I would remember what we're calling it. Um, I I actually totally agree with exactly what y'all just said. In terms of like what I personally got out of it, I definitely had nuggets of like things to think about. I gave it a four and a half star because I think for the what it is, it's a great version of it. And I think it 
is a step further than we've seen some of these kinds of discussions around feminism go in terms of like actually like bringing an intersectional perspective and like I think it's a very shareable book I think it was also helped by the fact that I read it right after Bad Fat Black Girl so like the experience of reading them together was a great experience it's me I'm assuming okay um what's the question shit I really got to get my life together Introduce yourself. Oh, hi. What you what you rated the book? I really I really want Angelo to do it because I still can't remember the video we were in when you did it, and I was going to write it down because it was so good, and I always get tongue tied when I have to introduce myself. Um, okay, they call me Bree in those internet streets. Um, I have a YouTube channel called Lock Petition, and also a Plant Tube channel. Uh, finally, I remember that, called Lock Plantation. Get your plant tips from me, y'all. Get your plant tips from your girl, okay? Don't be out there not watering your soil. If any of y'all got humidifiers, this is your reminder to refill them. You know who you are out there. Um, I talk about a lot of things. I like to read a lot of things, but personally, I really like mystery, thriller, and horror um, and historical fiction saw Bay action of that, of course. Um, I'm in a lot of projects and uh, I created Black Awinathon, which is something I do every October and it's focused only, only Black, Black is allowed, Black authors um, who write in crime fiction. Um, and I just, you know, I try to bring some humor to some things. Uh, I'm from New Orleans and I'm a therapist. So that is what I'm going to say for all of it. Um, and uh, what I read two times um, couple, last year, I believe. I didn't reread it again because I took so many notes. I just bought the notes. Uh, <laughs> to this. But I reread it twice. Um, I have a video on my channel about how this book is like a good beginner book for you to start knowing that full, uh, the first wave of um, white woman feminism was not inclusive at all. Um, and I talk about how um, if you read this book and also how to be anti-racist, it can kind of expand on some of those points that is made in the book. So um, I think those two books would be a good pairing. Uh, and that is, and I gave it five stars. I had to look on Goodreads and see what I gave it. I gave it, I gave it five stars. I got my notes up. Come on, internet, so don't do this to me. Okay, and that's it. I think I've been talking too damn long. <laughs> Um, so for anyone just entering, you're getting my silky jazz voice because I'm sick. But also, it just started getting kind of dark outside. So if I just drop off, I'll just keep talking, okay? If my internet, just keep going <laughs> with the discussion. But I um, I gave Hood Feminism three stars. I, I do think it's a great intro, just... I don't know if it's what I just read reading mediocre right before or the combination of just all the things I've read in the last year. I don't know if it added a lot for me. Of course, it always adds something different because it's from a different perspective, a different person. And I really loved her personal things she shared. But um, so, yeah, I'm just interested in discussion what different people felt like they got from um, the book. So Jess, can I, can I say something? Mm -hmm. I think I would have rated it three stars if it wasn't my first book on it, it, uh, feminism not being uh, just for, wait, hold on. Let me try to get the sentence. <laughs> I think I would have rated it three stars too if this wasn't my first book to read about or my first book that actually acknowledged that feminism was not meant for other women of color, women with different disabilities, etc. It's because it was my first, I was like, oh my God, all oh, this is so new. It's great. I was whizzing all over the place because I was excited, you know. And then I just read Burnout, which I think also adds to this discussion, right? So mm -hmm. it's just like 
I've read a lot of books since then <laughs> that I can also recommend that would add to the, the girth of this situation. But it was, if I was you in your brain, I would have been like, yes, yeah, given three, sis. I already know all of this. But I think that that's an interesting point, though, because I, what I'm actually hearing is that we're all basically saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, which I think is just an interesting commentary on like reviewing in general and how um, different people have different like criteria that they rate books by. So that's part of why book, this is part of why booktube exists, right? Like, because, you know, just like saying a rating doesn't give you the full context of like what is going into that rating. Um, so anyway, I just think it's interesting because we, I, it sounds like we all had pretty close to the same opinion about the book. Yeah. Um, Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I feel similarly. I was actually wondering, I'm curious, I feel bad. I know I'm not hosting, but I kind of want to ask a question along these lines of, do you think it's a good entry point for people who would feel heard by this book, but not necessarily a good entry point for people who, I hate to put it this way, but almost need to be convinced that these are problems? Because I know uh, my channel primarily is about fantasy books. And when I did my 22 books to read in 2022, I talked about here are 22 books that I don't typically gravitate towards, or maybe are different genres or things like that. And then this book was one of those things. And I definitely got a few comments of, I only care about fantasy. I don't care about the wokeness, like those kinds of comments. And I'm like, well, it's the kind of book that maybe would be good for those people to read, except for they're not going to read it. Or maybe they're not going to Maybe this wouldn't be a good intro for them because it's not diving deeper. It's not giving them those stats. I'm just, I don't know if that's fair. I probably agree. To her. Okay. I was, it's no, not no, I, I, I agree. Um, so I just read Burnout and it talks about like um, how we are experiencing stress and how we need to end our stress cycles and like how the patriarchy has um, added to women and people have been socialized as women um, of how we experience stress and how we need to deal with it and all these different things on like how to better yourself. Um, but a lot of it also touched to different points of feminism and how um, it can typically be uh, inclusive. Like in Hood Feminism, there's a line that says solidarity is still for white women. So it's like, um, it expands deeper in burnout. And I feel like if you read burnout, you would be like, oh, they're stretching. They're just trying to say stress is equal to patriarchy and that's that's a stretch. You know what I mean? Like I think people would have a hard time connecting with that if they haven't read literature about those notions prior. Um, but hood feminism is literally telling you like, hey, um, feminism should be intersectional. And indigenous women, here's a page or two. With women who are disabled, here's a page of two. With folks who are incarcerated, here's a page or two. With folks who are homeless, here's a page of two. When we think about food sovereignty, when we think about all different types of sovereignty, it's just like, it's just telling you like, hey, I want you to be on a lookout yeah. that these things exist. Right. And let I me think... show you how they exist. Is yeah. this the book? In case, yes. in case other people, I'm making a list of the books that get referenced. <laughs> um, I think I was really excited to see that she used uh, Evicted as a reference because that's a book, while it's not framed as here's why eviction is a feminist issue, it's obviously an issue for a lot of people, just like a lot of things in this. And for me, feminism is about trying to help everyone have, and they talk about equity being different from equality, but I, that's the thing is evicted is is such a great example of like kind of what you're saying where she lets you know here's an issue and then here's a source where you can get more about that so it's a good I almost wanted to go to the um references in the back and then check out those books because I think like Mara pointed out we're all kind of saying similarly maybe we're familiar with some of this but it's a great point for what are some issues maybe I'm not realizing relate to this topic yeah, the eviction part made me cry. I know. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I've, I've experienced that a lot with my mother. Mm -hmm. So it's it just really messed me up. I think that book from Matthew Desmond is like 
it's really hard read, but I think it's really impactful. Um, should be taught in school. <laughs> yeah, I'm tearing up even just thinking about it right now. I'm like, oh God, that book put me through a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I and I do, I totally agree with what you guys are saying. Like, I think, and I don't know, maybe that's something we can even get to later in, in the stream is like, hey, if you were interested in this, this chapter, like, do we have a recommendation of a book that could like, that's a great kind idea. of be your next yeah. step? It's fiction, but the downstairs girl, it's not as hard to read because there's a sense of, I think, something cheery to it. And the main character is so charming. But that's a great way of showing that when we were first seeing in America, at least women starting to advocate for themselves, it was only a certain kind of woman that they wanted in the conversation. And even though it's fiction, it's obviously based in a lot of real things. So if anybody's interested in that one, the downstairs girl is uh is definitely a good one i think to highlight some of these things yeah let's put evicted on the list too <laughs> so good and like you said al even though it's not blatantly talking about feminism one of the big takeaways i did get from that book was oh this is like i think there was a line in that book that was like if black men's issue is they are being put in jail for drug crimes of the war on drugs the black eviction. woman is fighting eviction like this is their battle yes mm -hmm. like yeah. and that really i mean i read that book five years ago and that is just like stuck with me <laughs> and there, there's a part in this mm -hmm. one too in hood feminism where she talks about the there was one moment where they had mold and they essentially had to live out of a hotel and had she not been in the financial circumstances to do that that could have started the cycle of eviction for them and that's a moment in the book where i almost wished she had taken us through what would happen if she hadn't had that and finding an example of Here's, this isn't just purely anecdotal. Here's actual stats that show, okay, this happens and then this doesn't come through or it takes so much time for this assistance that by the time you get it, you're in this situation and kind of showing you just how easy it is to fall into the situation. And then on top of it, when you have children, how much more difficult it is to get back on your feet because you're constantly trying to care for them as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh. oh, no, go ahead, Bray. I think, sorry, I'm trying to make sure I'm organizing the words in my head right. So I also feel like upon like re-looking at my notes and especially that eviction part, I think it, I think it would be a good analysis to talk about how COVID-19 has affected feminism and things like that because, um, you know, we have different uh, what is it called? Like uh, when they tell you guidelines, there we go. We have different guidelines on like, you know, you have to stay home, you have to do this, you have to do that. But if you're at a job that's not salary, yeah, how are you, how are you paying your bills? And if you keep getting exposed or in places where the exposure is easy, even if you're vaccinated, boosted and whatever, and you keep getting COVID or have to keep getting sent home and you're not salary, you're not able to pay your bills. And the, so it's eviction, like we, the eviction issue is definitely present. I almost feel like if he hasn't already, I should look. Matthew Desmond has talked about eviction during the pandemic because there were instances of landlords getting money to try and make up for the fact that the people living under them couldn't pay, but then they would yeah. hold on to that money and they would find other reasons to kick people out besides just they're not paying. They would find, oh, like, yeah. oh, you broke this particular guideline, which they didn't really, but they would find reasons to get rid of them and then use the money to improve the building so that they could charge more to new people. And you're like, that should be criminal. I That mm -hmm. should not be allowed. And I, In anyway. Boston right now, the rent's getting absurd and they keep saying we renovated. And I'm like, no, you fixed the hole in the floor. That's not a renovation. Like... <laughs> You fixed a part yeah. of the building code. And Go rent on. is at, is, is just high. Uh, I just feel like I'm yeah. moving to a very small town and they have the audacity to want to charge me 1500 for a one bedroom. Uh, yeah. There are barely 3000 folks here there. Seven years ago. <laughs> and it's like, it's, yeah, it's so infuriating because now it, it gets into these cycles of like the same way that, um, eviction and i think that in evicted matthew desmond really lays this out like how it is a cycle the same is the opposite because 
I was able to buy a house in 2019. And so now because of COVID, I've refinanced and my interest rate is like two point something. And so now my mortgage on this house is like, way lower than what I could rent my previous yeah. place I was renting from. Mm -hmm. And my real estate value has skyrocketed because of the pandemic and because of like everyone freaking out. So it's like, it's the opposite cycle. And the right. only reason that I was able to do that was because of like generational knowledge and generational wealth and being set up to have a job where I could afford a down payment on a house. Like it's so infuriating and so clear when you see the, the cycles and the paths that people get on. And then the narrative around it is, Oh, well, you know, like people just need to work harder or, right. you know, if they had chosen to do this, then things would be different. And it's like, well, that's like so reductive and not yeah. like you're living in a child's fantasy world if you think that's how the, the world well, works. And like in my last um, apartment, the one I lived in for five years, there was a family that lived below me. And I knew that because I gave them some of my old stuff. And I realized like they lived in a one bedroom apartment with like six people or like there were a lot of people living there, but they had opposite work schedules and they like, were figuring it out. The pandemic happened. Suddenly all these people are like forced to be at home all the time and they weren't evicted, but that's still like the mental health of that situation could not be good. Like I was just hearing the baby crying and I was kind of going a little insane, like to have no separation. And like, that's just what they could afford because that place probably only costs like 1300 a month split between all of them and stuff like that. Um, I know we keep referencing a lot of other books, but I think something that this book talks about and I can give a personal experience that is relating to all of this is the part where they talk about that woman who kept having people come to their house saying, I want to buy your house. And in that instance, there's also some racism because when they see her outside, they're like, are you the person who does the yard work? Like they don't even realize she's the homeowner. But after my dad passed away, because for those that maybe don't know, I moved in with him and was his caretaker before he passed away and he lives in a mobile home or he did. And so like, I live here now. And people are constantly trying to buy this house so that they can probably fix it up and then rent it and charge a bunch for it. But I would have people calling me, texting me, coming to the house. And so it can be very like you feel uncomfortable because people keep coming and they keep contacting you and you're like, ah, oh, leave me alone. Um, but I want to also a uh, part that I tabbed in the book about um, being able to afford housing and things like that. It mentions, um, I'm just, do you guys mind if I read? I, it's a little bit because it's relating to, it says, we know that without a home, individual families suffer and fall further into poverty, yet eviction rates and the price of food continue to rise all while wages remain stagnant and the cycle gets even harder to navigate, especially when work requirements are introduced, ones which ignore that childcare is a necessity for women with very young children. Is it possible to work a full-time job when you can't even afford part-time childcare? Or is this a policy guaranteed to create even higher hurdles? Paid maternity leave is a wonderful cause, but what happens after the baby is born and you weren't making enough money to support one person, much less navigate these new higher expenses? I think that ties kind of nicely to what we're talking about. You also, I, that wasn't too far away, I think, from a chapter where she talks about reproductive health rights and how that needs to be more intersectional, which was also a chapter that enraged me. Not, wasn't surprising, but just, you know, casual oh, enrage. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's interesting because we're talking about, um, you know, Brie, I think, set this up really nicely when she was talking about the book at the beginning of a lot of what this book is about is critiquing sort of like first wave feminism or second wave feminism. that was very white and very focused. But it's interesting because I know, you know, when I think of that um, kind of era, one of the main people I think of is Gloria Steinem, right? But I've heard her talk in the past before and say something to the effect of the reason why I'm so focused on feminism is because I believe that if we focused on women's equality, literally it helps every single other issue that we're trying to combat around the world. Like it impacts global warming. It impacts, um, you know, like in, in, uh, child abuse. It impact like literally name an issue. And if there was true equality for women, it would be impacted. Now the irony is that that generation like couldn't even see in their own backyard, like how exclusionary their efforts to do that were. But I, I do really resonate with that. Like, I truly think that that is a reality that if we focused on women's equality, it would be a significant um, 
moving of the needle for literally every other issue that we talk about in society. I, uh, um, I want to extend some condolences as far as the way people are treating your parents. That's terrible. Yeah. It'd be illegal for people to come do this. I hate it. For the, um, so earlier when we were talking, um, because we were all saying it's like a good introduction and depending on when you read it, maybe that kind of forms what you think about the text. Have you, I'll say, I guess in the last six months to a year, read any other like feminist texts or like texts that talk about racism? Because like I've read, we obviously just read Mediocre in Jan January, <laughs> January, February. Um, and then we read Cast before that. Like yeah, Cast. And I've read like Stamped. Um, I just feel like I've read a, a good amount in the last year. And so to me, I, that, that's why I was like, oh, okay. You know, I've, I've heard these things before, but I don't know if any of y'all, well, I know what Angela's been reading because she's been reading one. <laughs> well, even before that, like I read White Rage two summers ago, which is like the opposite of an intro nonfiction read. <laughs> it's like a dex. It's very dense and like you, it, it's not meant to be narrative. It's not meant to like help you consume it easily which she references white rage in hood feminism like oh yeah i know that concept because i read a whole book whose thesis was this is what white rage is and here's my proof sort of thing and then i've read just mercy and i've read evicted i've read a lot of race things so i guess this one took a lot of the books that had focused in on certain injustices right. and like summarized them yeah which is fine <laughs> i just the anecdotes finished. from home mm -hmm. like, I just finished reading um, Trailblazer um, about the first black woman reporter at the Washington Post. Mm. And mm -hmm. that one was interesting because part of it is memoir. And then part of it is also sort of laying out for people what segregation was like and what it was like to be a reporter, a black woman reporter in that time and the kinds of racism that she faced so it was like a lot of personal examples, but also just things that maybe you briefly heard about when hearing about civil rights in school, but probably not really. You know, like she'll reference Martin Luther King going to a speech, but she'll also reference a lot of things that I think a lot of us don't know either anything about or enough about. Um, and I know it's I know hearing from someone else is not the same as reading, but Sean is currently reading my husband is currently reading a book about Thurgood Marshall and this one particular case uh where these men were accused of something and the way that trial played out and it it's just a very rage inducing book um so again I know it's not the same but we like constantly talk about the things we're reading so that's one uh it's called De uh, devil devil in the grove I think that's the name of it um, so that's when I want to pick up kind of relates to this a little bit too. Mm -hmm. I would um, say two. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Brie. Oh no, Mara, we constantly go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, two that come to mind that I think relate to some of the topics that came up in this, um, I guess three, one is work won't love you back by Sarah Jaffe. It's a lot about, um, like the well, particularly the first half of it is a lot about undervalued and underpaid care work, which is disproportionately done by women of color, at least in this country. And I think that that is a common experience around the world. Um, so I think that one is really good for sort of like the work and pay element of it. Um, Twisted by Emma DeBerry is about um, black women's hair and sort of like double standards for beauty like beauty standard stuff and I, I found it mm -hmm. and I, I also incorporates a lot about African philosophy and how mm -hmm. that has influenced um how beauty standards have evolved differently in different countries like it makes me want to read it. more about African philosophy mm -hmm. um and then bad fat, fat black girl I mentioned that at the beginning but I think that's a great memoir and really I think it pairs nicely with this in terms of like applying some of the ideas that get brought up in this to somebody's actually actual like lived experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, walk with me through this long list, Lord. Uh, <laughs> or is it a long list? No, I won't make it long. 
I'm just, yeah, I'm gonna cut a bunch because I don't wanna be taking up too much time uh, talking. But um, I would say I just read, I've been getting into bell hooks. If you haven't been getting into bell hooks, please get into bell hooks. Um, I just finished, um, what was it? Something about, I think feminism is for everybody. I remembered. Um, it's a short read. It is wonderful inside and out. Um, and she is a black author and she talks about pretty much intro level to feminism and saying, you know, she's, she's writing underneath the premise that feminism, the, the talks about it is very niche. It tends to be like in, you know, institutions of learning or in small groups of people. And most people, if you ask them what feminism is, they're gonna tell you they don't know what it is. So this book is to tell you, this is what feminism is. Um, you took the word right out of my mouth, P, The Color of Law is a yeah. fantastic read. Um, it definitely will make you angry um, because it literally is not um, a book where it's like, let me tell you my wonderful thoughts. It is facts. Like this yeah. is when the law changed. This History. is when the president came. This is yeah. this, like, this is what Nixon and Reagan and all of these things did and how it was built to systematically be against people of color and gerrymandering and like all these different things. So um, the color in law is a fantastic read. I already talked about burnout. Um, I would say uh, mediocre as well. Um, and also 21 days of white supremacy, I would add, because the questions that it asks can help you be more reflective on how um, you think about feminism and how engaging it could be. Um, and then if you're looking for fiction, um, I have, and this is me not trying to shout myself out, but I, there's no other way to not shout myself out. Um, I have a book club called the Black Classics Book Club, where we read Black classics every month. And every Black classics we have read involves feminism of some kind. And you can t clearly see that Black women were left out of it in the early 1900s uh, and et cetera. So you can clearly see how if we would have solved some of those problems, a lot of those black women wouldn't have dealt, wouldn't have had to deal with any of those things. So, um, and even in Invisible Man, you can see it. Um, the books by Ann Petrie, The Street, The Narrows. Um, I'm trying to think of some other books. Um, Not Without Laughter by Langston Hughes. Um, there's just so many different books that can help you understand that we need to be more um, inclusive. We need to think about equity. We need to think about all those things. We're thinking about feminism. Um, it just be better citizens to each other. I know that was long-winded, kind of kumbaya, but no, uh, that was beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I'm taking notes <laughs> here. Um, I, I want to, I know, uh, I think when Jess asked if we had books that uh, it was not just relating to feminism, but also race. Uh, so Between the World and Me is fantastic. If you've never read ta Coates, just get ready to be sad. <laughs> a lot of the book. And that one does a great job of showing the way that when you're in a constant state of essentially adrenaline being what uh, forces your body to move forward because you're in a constant state of fear because there's so much violence around you. It's just hard to even go to school. It's hard to go anywhere. Uh, that one, I think, does a great job of highlighting how difficult that is. Um, and then for maybe outside the U.S., uh, Trevor Noah's memoir, I think, is also a really good one. Um, Born a Crime. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, Born a Crime. And then um, I just want to add to what Bree was saying. With The Color of Law, that's a great one to pair with Evicted. Because mm -hmm. Evicted is written in a way where it's almost like watching a documentary and it's a little bit more like involving specific people. And then like, like Brie was saying, color of laws, here's all the laws. And so it's not as easy to read because it's just one statistic after the next, but it does a great job of showing even when the laws themselves would go in the right direction, the ways in which people like sneaky racism, you know, they're like, what if we just put this in the homeowners association that you have to do this, this, and this, which they know would. It's not that sneaky. Well, 
yeah. but like don't find new ways. Yeah. <laughs> Not sneaky, but as in like, let's just find a new way to do this. Yeah. But like hide it in certain things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now a, they just it, price it, people out. Me and my fiance, we make a lot of money and we still had to get a co-signer for our apartment and we're like second generation wealth. So like, how do people who are first generation wealth get apartments? I don't even know. Listen, uh, <laughs> they want me to make three, they want me to make uh, three times that 150. I'm gonna tell y'all I ain't got it. <laughs> like, what? Well, I also don't know. Like, it's like, I, I literally do not understand how people afford to have children. Like, I, I literally cannot do the math of how anybody affords to have children now. And then the boomers are mad that they're not getting grandkids. And I'm like, y'all, y'all start my dying grandma and tells that me. wealth and maybe it'll start Straight happening. <laughs> my grandma asked me that. I said, no, Granny, you, you have a grandson. And how many children do he has? Bree, that's not the point, Granny. Answer the question. <laughs> Well, he has about 10. Exactly. He had it for all of us. He <laughs> yeah, has a kid for all of us. We good, yeah. Granny. I wanted to add um, The Body is Not an Apology um, by Sonia Renee Taylor. I keep um, meaning to read that, but the, oh, like, the library hold list is always so long, which is good, but. Uh, it's giving. I also want to add great. The New Jim Crow. Yeah. Just going to well, sparkle if that if, in your life. If we're uh, packing it on here, um, Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde. Sister Outsider as well. Amen. Is fantastic. Um, I think that a good way to look at sort of the general, like the flip side of all of this is uh, white trash. It's basically about the development of the white underclass and how basically. Oh, that was a rough book. It, uh, oh, <laughs> well, but like in 16, whatever. <laughs> Oglethorpe is like if you bring slavery to the U.S., you are setting up a situation where there will be a perpetual clash between the slaves, the enslaved people who come here, and the white underclass whose jobs they're basically replacing. And like we will never get out from under this. So like it's rough, but it is. It's like I think that... eviction. The way that Matthew Desmond observed that people that were in, it was kind of like a trailer park and it was a lot of uh, people who were white as opposed to in other areas where he was observing a lot of people of color. And in this particular white, uh, primarily white neighborhood, they always saw it as just like a moment in their life. They're just kind of passing through. This is just, I've just kind of stumbled into this, but I'm going to get out of it. And sometimes that moment would be 25 years, 45 years. It was just most of their life, but they always saw it as, well, we're not like them over there. So even when it's, you know, as, as an outsider, Matthew Desmond's like, I mean, you guys are all facing <laughs> the same sorts of things. And instead of coming together and trying to find ways out of it, you instead think, well, I'm a little, I'm above that. There's always somebody exactly. below. And I want to answer something from way earlier. Someone was asking if I was writing it down. Jess is writing a bunch of this down. All these book wrecks. <laughs> She's too uh much. Someone said, I'm looking for more racism and feminism nonfiction from outside the U.S., which I agree. I'm always behind mm -hmm. on that. One that I keep meaning to get to is I think it's called White Tears, Black Scars, Black Scars, White Tears. And it's about um, it's from the Australian perspective. Mm -hmm. I've heard that one is really great. And then, um, oh, gosh, what was that big one from the U.K. a couple of years ago? Ooh, I'll think of it. Just I, I know I can see the cover. I know which one you're talking about. That's not helpful to anyone here, but. Is it why I'm no longer talking about race? Is that the UK one or no? Yes. Yeah, that's one of them. Um, and then there was another one, I think. Oh, God. Okay, just a second. Uh, 21, 21 Days of White Supremacy is outside of the US, I believe. I think that lady is from the UK. Unless I'm wrong. I think Let also me Google that. there are a lot of uh, books that are not marketed as being relating to feminism but they do still cover issues that relate to feminism yeah. or, or race and they're all kind of intertwined so that's another aspect i haven't read it yet but i know our women on the ground i think is about women reporters in the middle east yeah. um but i'm not i'm not saying i recommend it. i haven't read it yet but that's another one that i think likely dives into issues facing women in a, in a different perspective uh um fearing the black body by sabrina 
Stings, Strings, I never remember her last name. Um, yep, I have that book. I like how this has turned into like 20 minute long. Like, here are some other books. I guess yeah. the takeaway is that we're getting like, this is such a great, as far as uh, our first initial conversation about this, is it's good for finding more things to jump into uh, that dive into these more specific things. I know this is completely unrelated as far as it would seem at first, but I read the book, The Secret Life of Groceries. And at one point in the book, mm. the author shadows a trucker because it's part of the grocery industry. And the trucker he shadows happens to be a woman. And then not surprisingly, uh, there's of course so many issues affecting women, even in that field, more so than I would say a lot of other fields because they there aren't that many women who are truckers and this is a terrible thing to bring up but they often have to deal with sexual harassment uh one woman was raped under her truck likely by other truckers and just terrible terrible things like that that you're just like people suck <laughs> you read it you're like ah i have i don't have a whole lot of hope for the world <laughs> but then you know you look at cute pictures of dogs or something and you're like, I will persevere. So something I was thinking of, because it was kind of what we talked at the beginning, right? Is like, who is this book meant for? And I know someone in the comments was saying it was kind of meant for maybe moderate to maybe moderate left white women who really don't know intersectionality. And I think that's true, especially in the context of the Midwest where the author's from. Because something that struck me that felt almost heavy handed, but I understand what she was doing is the gun reform chapter where she was very upfront about how she loves her guns and loves to go to shooting ranges and stuff like that, but is very pro gun reform and how this affects all women. And I'm like, that's definitely something you say if you want someone from Michigan to listen to you, like regardless of their political background, like there are certain parts of the Midwest specifically who are like very into their guns for like just shooting ranges and hunting and things like that. So I feel like maybe, especially cause she's from the Midwest, maybe that's who her audience was that the white neighbors that she's lived around just being like, I know you're not bad people. I see you all the time. I just want to throw this book at you and just. But it, it does. And I mean, like, I'll say this to my fellow white ladies, like <laughs> until I think what we found in the 2016 election in particular was like, but I mean, everyone has known this for a long time, but I think it's become more like a general accepted truth as opposed to just something that's kind of brushed under the rug, is that white women are culturally and socially incentivized to identify more with their race in terms of solidarity than with their gender. And if that was realigned, things would change in 20 years do you know what i mean like until white women are willing to think more about like all women as opposed to all white people like nothing will change politically so i do while i think that that could be a i could see what you just said angela is being a critique of the book but i actually think that i'm oh, really it's appreciative it's not of, a critique i think that's good i think that's the project oh, of the book yeah but that's what i'm saying is i think yeah. some people would hear that and see it as a critique okay. of like well why is it aimed at these sort of like center center white ladies it's because if that group actually was realigned politically it would change america like it really really would so like i'm appreciative of someone like mickey kendall doing the work to write a book like this because like over time it could move the needle um anyway i just like i i when we think about who it's written for I agree that that's who it's written for. And if that's part of what Mickey Kendall's project is in terms of like her long-term thinking, then I think it makes a lot of sense to have more and more of these sort of like intro level um, books about intersectional feminism. Especially since it's good to have multiple flavors. Like I feel like Mediocre is also very much a feminist text that doesn't actually say it's about intersectional feminism, but it really is like, it's very much on the page. And that one I think is more palatable for more people but I still think hood feminism is a good, an important side of that coin. Like you, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like they're both angry in different ways and have different perspectives that are important. But if I had to pick one to give someone I was trying to bring over, I would probably pick mediocre more often. That's interesting. I haven't read that one. You don't think that that one is more likely to bring about the defensive side? I just, I'm just basing this off of the, the title. They're both very angry. I think if someone's going to get defensive, both like I don't think either one is calm in their tone <laughs> I guess it's just it makes me sad because I wish that as a society when we're discussing issues and we're pinpointing 
specific groups that are more likely to be affected by certain issues, or we're pinpointing groups that have maybe accidentally or purposefully uh, perpetuated certain things. I wish, I wish that defense wouldn't kick in so hard. I wish we could just listen and reflect before immediately getting upset because at the end of the day, I mean, reading this book, there's a lot of kind of like uh, Morrow and you're like to my fellow white ladies, there's a lot of so many instances of like white women, white women, white women. And I wasn't sitting there like, ah, like upset by it. I'm because... sitting there like girl, I know. Like, <laughs> And I know it's, it's strange because, you know, you were saying if you, if we, if we stop thinking about like defending our whiteness so much, essentially, I kind of rephrasing what you said. So apologies if that's not really what you're saying. But if we stop doing that and we just reflect on issues and we understand that these issues are issues that they're human issues. And I just wish that we could, we could see that. And like I said, while, yeah, they, they tend to affect, you know, maybe they're going to affect immigrants, more people of color more often. That's a truth that should then not make you think, well, it's not my problem. I don't know why seeing that something affects another group that maybe isn't the same skin color, isn't the same religion, isn't the same gender. I wish that we like, I wish that so often people could look at that and recognize, like you were saying, if we could try to fix these issues, it would fix so many other things too. It just makes me sad that people have to. But that's, I mean, reaction. as someone living in the, living in think... the South, that's just not where a lot of people are. And I mean, like you, it's a journey, hopefully that people are willing to take, but I mean, I saw, I, I remember this cause it was right when I moved back from Canada to North Carolina and I was in line and it was right after the marriage equality bill had, had passed the Supreme court. And I, I was in line and I heard these two white ladies behind me whispering about people who were in front of me in line. And at first I thought they were talking about this gay couple that was ahead of us. And I was like, Oh my God, really? But I realized they were not talking about a gay couple. They were talking about a black woman and a white man who were, together in line ahead of us and i'm like that was 2015 so like some people and they live in north carolina it cannot be the only time that they see interracial couples out and about like like, i don't that's uh, where some that's where a huge chunk of people are so like yeah a friend of mine was talking about how she worked for a, a company that almost like a meal delivery not almost that's what it was it was a meal delivery service and one of their ads had an interracial couple and somebody was emailing angry that there was an interracial couple in one of the ads and you're like really this is this is your problem these are the problems problems uh Mm -hmm. that you you want to focus on they're not problems by the way just to clarify in case that wasn't clear but um yeah i think i know i grew up in a very very religious community and when i was young i think i had that instinct to be defensive about things because nobody ever talked in that way where it's like, hold on, just, just calm down. <laughs> uh, nobody ever was just presenting these things because I think the area I grew up in, it was very much about like the kinds of people that are being critiqued in this particular book. It was also a wealthy area. Um, and so I had that, uh, I had that instinct, I guess you could say for a long time. But there's just there's a part of me with all issues that I feel like, especially with social media, if you're of a certain age, at some point, I I feel like once you're past the age of 25, just there's so many opportunities to listen. Like older generations, to some degree, are so within the bubble of where they grew up and the kinds of things they were told over and over and over and over again. They didn't have other perspectives as often. And if they weren't well educated, they didn't have the opportunity to maybe read other perspectives. It was like they got this one mindset in them for so long. And so I understand why things would then be harder for them. But I just feel like if you're young, at some point, you just have to, you don't have to agree about everything, but it it shouldn't be that difficult like you were saying those two women i don't know how old they were but like how do you still look at those things and think that they're somehow affecting you in a negative way look at the things that are affecting literal people like actual human beings like poverty and hunger and things like that and and just want to help i don't but i like this comment i i feel like in between here that there's just a small I don't know, I want to say a small demographic they're written for because the people it needs to reach, I don't think are reading or are not going to read a book by 
a black yeah. person, by a queer, you know, like the people who need to learn more about the people that they just disagree with just on their principle aren't reading these texts. So but what, it, what it does do, though, for people maybe like me who aren't good at words is if I read enough intro words by other people, when I'm in a situation with someone, at least then I have something I can pair it. That is better than me just going, why are you so stupid? Why can't you be empathetic? Which won't work. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. So I think it is useful for people like us who have been already well read in intro nonfiction to read it. Who, like, I'm just forced to interact with my Midwest family all the time. And it's just nice sometimes to have, like, logical, level-headed, like, lines to just be like, this is not a comment on Facebook. This is just actual, like facts that I have read in a nonfiction book and we can discuss maybe depending on the audience some people I just don't talk to in my family because it's not productive <laughs> but I mean like I think some of those groups are like not like to your point Jess th there's a very specific place you are in your journey of of awareness and like re and acting on awareness of your white privilege Th this book can meet you in a very specific point in that journey but it ain't going to, you're not going to start here if you don't even think, like somebody was saying that, um, I think Jessica was saying, like, she knows people who don't even think that white kids should date black kids. Like, if that's where you are, this book isn't going to help you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, this is, you know, on the continuum, you have to be to a place where you're, like, curious and, like, even open to some of these ideas for you to even pick the book up. Do you think that, Oh, okay. Jess has this prompt up. Um, well, because what, what Angela was saying, um, because I, well, one, I started reading nonfiction, obviously, just to learn more. And I continue to read ones of similar topics because I just, you know, want to learn more on that topic and have points of just, I don't know, I guess points of reference or things to talk to people with. Um, in my mind, when I have a discussion with my family, the one day I'm ready, it's never going to happen. <laughs> but so something because I was reading like two to three star reviews of uh, put feminism and some people were saying they wish there was more like, you know, statistics, statistics, statistical stuff to go with it. Like it felt some people felt like it was more just um, a lot Twitter feed or maybe just like stream of conscious her thoughts. So I don't know if you think it would have been if I know there were some. But I don't know if y'all thought it would have benefited Chris. Sometimes I like to have those things because when I'm like Andrew, I'm like, look, 25% more, da 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 da. And he's like, oh my God. But I don't know if that would affect your enjoyment or what you think about the book at all. I I think that some of it kind of depends on the sort of reader you are and what impacts you. I think some people are impacted almost by personal stories that someone is telling, this is my experience. And then some people are more impacted by the stats. And I also think maybe this is a, a reach, but I think society has told men that statistics, like you like statistics, women like emotions. And I'm not saying that that's inherently true, but some people then internalize that and think that they need that. I think both are important. I think it's important to not uh, strip somebody's emotions from something because emotions matter uh but i also think that statistics back up why people are feeling a certain way so i think it's good to have both i don't think this book had like i think that the soda when she talks about soda i thought that was i thought that portion was fantastic and maybe that's not a part that sticks out to a lot of people but i remember having a conversation with somebody for so long because my dad grew up in complete poverty so I remember having a conversation where someone's like, it's not expensive to eat healthy. And I was like, listen, <laughs> like, and I just went for so long. And I feel like this is a great example of we see people judging someone for giving their kid a soda and talking about all the sugar and things like that. When she talks about the shelf life of soda and she talks about the way that that it's not all that expensive compared to other things. Also, the uh, food deserts and things like that. But those same people that would judge them are going to have that, what was it, like a Frappuccino or something that has more sugar. But we don't we don't get upset at like, I'm just going to, because they talk a lot about white feminism. We don't get upset at the white woman hustling who's got to get her Starbucks in the morning and saying like, how can you put that in your body? But we see soda on a young kid living in the inner city and we're like, oh, what terrible parenting. And just that 
judgment and having those stats of aspects of like the soda tax and things like that, I thought were really, and talking about like the difference between that fancy coffee drink and the soda. Um, but maybe that's just because I am the kind of person that does like both that emotional and statistical side. I saw somebody said something earlier. I, I thought this was at its strongest when she did go into those, especially the welfare sections. Cause mainly cause I don't have experience with that. So hearing about the intricacies of what that was like, um, reaffirming things that I did know, but also Jess has been sending me TikToks. Cause if you know, Jess, she just sends you TikToks about anything she thinks relates to your life. Mm -hmm. um, and she was sending me stuff about adoption. And that was reminding oh, me of your things. Like people just, if they think they have money, they think they know the best way to raise children. Yeah. Like th there's like this right of, I have X money, therefore I will be the best parent. And then looking down on people who have less and judging how people parent. And it's just. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. I do tend to agree though with what I think Julie Raisin just said though, is that I think that there is a bias or an assumption that numbers are neutral and that's just not the case. Like one thing that I think that we can really like learn from, like we being any person who's invested in like progressive ideas moving forward in the world is how effectively um, the queer community turned the narrative around about gay marriage and how quickly they did that really. And so much of that was focused on storytelling. So much of that was about like, can you imagine not being able to marry the person that you love? Like we as humans are, kind of like I, I read a book about this at some point but we're wired to respond more to personal story than we are to numbers like people are more like it goes back to like you know anic data is so pernicious on social media because it speaks to our human impulses of like how to understand information so deeply so like I do think that there is a really important place for storytelling in actually changing people's minds because I think that a lot of people are pretty numb to yeah. numbers and, and data. I, even with like the vaccine stuff, like they were telling a lot of scientists that like, yes, answer people's answers truthfully. If they want statistics, talk to them. But the way to change someone's mind was not with throwing numbers at them. It was relating to them on an emotional level and making them feel like they were a part of it. Like this was going to impact you and your community and you have a stake in the situation. Not that it's been working, obviously, but, you know. <laughs> I like Bree's comment in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I think, too, that statistics can be presented in a way to try to prove a point. And you have to sometimes dig deeper into statistics. So I think a great example is when people try to throw around, like, well, I don't even remember exact wording, but something like the, I, the idea that, like, there are more uh, people of color in certain communities, like, committing crimes and you're like oh, is it that there's but like let's also look at the population let's look at poverty let's look at all these things because it's almost like trying to prove trying to prove this idea like they just inherently are inclined to commit crimes and you're like no because then there's the statistic that shows regardless of race that poverty will present basically the exact same percentage of people committing crimes so if that particular area is in poverty that's what you should be looking at not the race of people as if like that's what is leading to them, you know, stealing or selling drugs or something like that. So I think that statistics can be warped in a sense, or maybe the number is true, but it's being used in a way that is honestly sort of false. And Context matters. Like a lot of medical statistics don't make sense because they were based off race but not based off where people are from latinx people are not in medical statistics because it's too complicated for them they're like well now we realize that people are not white black or brown we have a whole spectrum of people so we're just not putting them in medical studies yeah we don't make the cut <laughs> yeah the <laughs> black apartheid book i think just read that um and had a conversation about that um i've never been able to make it through because it just it gets it gets me every time I try to start reading it, but I need to buckle down and do it at some point. It's yeah. a journey. And that was published in 2006. I mean, still very relevant, but I would love like, I don't know, like an update or even just continuation because I'm sure there's just more to add, but I wanted to go back to, um, I have some starred comments. The question, because I had this as a question also, if you thought a diverse set of perspectives, like from different authors would have strengthened it. And I was um, 
because I saw that also like people thought maybe it would be better to have like a collection of essays from other black women or femmes. So I don't know if y'all had an opinion on that. I think it'd be a different book. I'd read that book. I think that'd be a very yeah. good book, but I don't know if that's this one. <laughs> I don't know. I It's interesting because you were pointing out that human beings react more to anecdata is the term you used, but I didn't find this book to be particularly um, emotional either. Uh, it was a lot of almost reflecting on statistics or reflecting on trends, reflecting on conversation points within feminism, and then kind of bouncing off of that, but not always in a way that was personal to her. And sometimes in an attempt at representing other people in the conversation, I don't want to say it ended up being shallow, but she references issues involving indigenous women, if uh, issues involving trans women, and she can only go so far in those things because she, that's not something that she has a connection to. So that I think that's why I feel sort of like this is such a uh, starting point because it's not like something like uh, Between the World and Me. Sorry to reference that one again with ta Codes. That one is like, oh my gosh, reading about this personal experience that he has, it's hits really hard. And then reading something like Evicted that has all of these statistics and you sort of have the narrative structure, you have these people going through things that you're like, these are real humans. You have to remind yourself because it feels like a movie. And this one was, I think, a lot of observations and then a little bit of personal commentary as well with the occasional statistic, the occasional personal story, the occasional this person said this sort of thing. Um, sorry, I feel I feel a little bad that I'm bouncing off of multiple different topics here. Um, but I think that I would definitely read a book that just involves, like you said, Angela, that's not this book to answer the question. I would read a book where it was a collection of essays, but maybe this one is just, that's not what this one is. I think even the title true. of this one is like, this is my, like, I grew up in the inner city perspective of intersectional feminism. Like, I think that's, that's the title of it, you know? Yeah. But also someone brought up in the chat that mediocre has a lot of stats and facts. And I also, when I remember mediocre, I remember the stories she tells. So I thought that was such a good blend of, okay, I'm hitting you with this fact, but also let's humanize it. And I, I just really like how that author really balanced it. That said, I, I do agree that this I th mediocre would these both books would make people defensive, but different people defensive in different ways. <laughs> I yeah. feel like, I don't know. I was going to mention that I read um, you... Disability Visibility. <clears throat> oh, go ahead, Brie. Oh, no, you can go. It's you, Brie. Can y'all you... You hear me? Yes. I just, I'm really struggling with my internet, so I'm sorry. Um so I was trying to like Google it really fast, but then my head was, was too big. So there is, I keep getting every copy or not every copy, every book written by this lady as an arc, um, Tamara Winfrey Harris. And she has um, a couple books. One of them is called Dear Black Girls. And the other one is called The Sisters Are All Right, Changing the Broken Narrative of Black Women in America. So if you're looking for additional narratives specifically to Black women, Black femmes, Black trans women, Black women X, um, just please read those and you will not be disappointed at, at all. Just wanted to say that to y'all. Uh, I'll bounce in really quick just to say I saw earlier somebody saying when they're having a conversation with I don't recall who it was I'm trying to find the comment um, when there's somebody that, that they know that when they're having conversations they're like well give me the stats and it's like I don't have the stats off the top of my head but I'm telling you this is how it is um, I'm, I don't know if any of you watch uh, Jubilee's videos uh, they had one recently where it was trans men having a conversation with very conservative men and one of the questions was i have male privilege and the way that those work is that if you agree with the prompt you step forward and the most of the trans men step forward and they were talking about well seeing as before when the world saw us as women and then now they see us as men uh we have lived that and and then one of the men that was conservative was arguing by saying you can't quantify privilege and I was like, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of stats. And one of the things they used 
was like, well, men get raped too. And you're like, that should not be used. Sorry. It makes me so <laughs> fucked when people say things like that. Like that's, it, you can quantify issues that affect some groups more than others and then recognize I am less likely to experience this. Doesn't mean that I might not ever. It doesn't mean that some people might not sometimes be condescending to me or not take me seriously or not want me to uh, get the pay I deserve. Like there's issues, of course, that affect you that are going to affect these other groups. But the other groups are probably going to have it affect them more often. And I guess stats are important in that sometimes there are people that just won't uh, that just won't listen unless you have some numbers. Um, right, no, I, I agree. I agree. I feel I want to apologize for this being blunt, but I'm also not sorry. So I'm going to take it back, even though my initial I'm trying to work on saying I'm sorry less. And the thank you for Shomala for pointing that out earlier, because I'm trying to work on saying it less. I just feel like there are white folks who use the devil advocacy um, to force you to state to state stats in order for them to hear, exa- example, a black woman saying that you have caused me harm. You have literally caused me harm. And I get so enraged when people be like, oh, I need stats. I need all the stats. I need I need you to approve. And I'm going to hide behind the devil advocate um, to pretty much gaslight you and make you feel like your experiences are null and void. And it mm-hmm. just pisses me off to the core of my being. And, you know, if it offended someone, I don't really care because it's horse shit and I've had enough of it and I'm just angry about it. That was the end of my TED talk. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think that's exactly why I get a little, I get a little defensive when people want to f- center stats, because I do think that, I also feel like it, it is sort of like a perpetuation of a specific kind of modern, like a masculine identity under, a masculine identity under modernity, which is this idea of, I'm a cold objective reasoner. And that the only reason why the world is the way it is, is because we have these men who were using cold logic to build everything you see around you. So how dare you question them? Um, And yeah, like, I think it's not that I don't enjoy, I mean, I love, hello, if you watch my videos, you know, I love some stats. Like I like numbers. I I, and I love being able to, somebody was talking about popping back off at people. I love it when I'm like, well, actually, when I get to be the well, actually person to them, I love it. But it was mediocre. Yeah. I mean, I also Mm. though resent that that's the standard of like, okay, but I'm telling you that I have experienced sexual violence and that that was able to happen because of x y and z circumstance so like i don't understand why you're fighting with me on whatever because that's not it's literally not my experience so why are you arguing with me about something that actually happened to me i think yeah and i'm really glad you brought this up because i think uh that you brought this up brie because i think some people you tell them something and they're like well that affected you but that's not an issue because i think it's a way to pass off that it's a way to try and take the burden of guilt off of their shoulders because people don't want to have to see the world for how it is. And I'm not saying because it it's true that you can't be fixing every problem. You can't know everything all the time. You're going to be ignorant about some issues. It's impossible to know everything about everything. But uh, and also it's important to acknowledge when you are consuming too much and then you are no longer in a position where you can help anybody because you need to help yourself at that time. But it's people shouldn't have to look around at problems and be like, well, it's only a problem if it what reaches this threshold. Like once it crosses this percentage, then it's a problem for a lot of people. It's a problem when it hits them. So why isn't it a problem when it's hitting other people and how many people does it need to hit before it's a problem? Like that's why, sorry to talk about, COVID stuff. But whenever people are like, well, technically the percentage of people that have died is not that high. And you're like, how many people need to die before, you know what I mean? Like uh, it's people's lives. Yeah. And it's all, yeah. It's also like say that to indigenous communities, 
say that to my community in Louisiana that was hit pretty hard, uh, Black folks in uh, Louisiana. So it's like you say statements that and you're not thinking of the intersections of those statements. And it's also um, when we think about like people separating themselves from things, it's um, I also get frustrated with uh with women, uh, specifically white women who be like, um, you know what? We don't claim her. No, claim her. Grab your sister. Educate her. Tell her what she's doing is not okay because Black women don't get that. We don't get that. We have to claim her and we are proud to claim her. That's and we'd be like, sis, that's not okay. You know, indigenous women claim her, you know, Asian women claim her, but white women want to be so detached from yeah. their, their other sisters. And I'm like, no, grab her, talk to her, tell her that she is causing harm. Tell her, that's Karen, good. this ain't for you. <laughs> that's a great point. And that's actually something that does get, uh, brought up in this is that there's a part in one of her classes where somebody basically the black community gets treated like we you hear people say this all the time like it's not a monolith but it still gets used against them if one person like I think I, mm -hmm. if uh, one of you can correct me if I'm wrong about it, I think that the example was that this girl was like you're not helping feminism when you're standing up for sexist black men or something like that and like you're seeing the fact that they're black before helping feminism or something like that. And then I guess like a lot of people in the class are like, excuse me, hold on a sec. How come when uh, the like you're saying, how come if it's a white woman doing something you don't agree with that you don't see that as like a thing like all of you have to deal with all of a sudden you see it as that one person. But when it happens in the black community, you see it as, oh, look at like all of them aren't actually yeah. helping the cause. And by the way, until white women are willing to claim that, they will continue to be perpetuators of um, white oppression. Because, like, that's the bottom line. Like, when, pe when I had people in my life after both of the last elections be like, I can't believe white women went for Donald Trump. I'm like, I believe it. If you don't believe it, you are not paying attention to the women in your lives. Because, like, I there's no question in my mind. Like, that surprises me 0%. So, like, if you're mad about it, what are you going to do about it? Like when the next time, you know, your sister, like literally maybe your biological sister says something that is like implicitly racist that she's not even thinking, are you going to call her out on it? Are you going to say to her, like, I don't know if this is what you meant, but like, this is what I'm hearing. Do you actually think that? Like, that is how you actually change day to day. And until you're willing to do that, you are perpetuating oppression like that. And know. it's also yeah. like, it's okay to be in the place where like, if that happens to you, you're frozen because you're like, I can't believe this happened. Someone said something very blatantly racist, homophobic, whatever to my face. And I'm just shocked that that came from their mouth because it's someone you know. But maybe like this happened to me with a family member where I'm like, I cannot believe that sentence was said. And I don't even know what to say to that. Like, no, like what Mara just said, it's okay to ask the question, what did you mean by that? Like to have responses ready and think about what if I'm in that situation because when you're thrown into it you think you'll do the right thing but sometimes you just it's like deer in headlights you're like I didn't expect this conversation to go here and I can't believe this person went there I'm just thinking about my husband who is a very <laughs> sweet empathetic person who's constantly trying to learn and sometimes as a as a man who is white people feel comfortable saying things in front of him and he's like he does he'll be like like so taken aback he like doesn't like his brain short circuits <laughs> um i do have a, a question about in this conversation about statistics and the fact that some people hearing a person's story isn't enough it's like well but like what's the stats though what a, what do you think about people who are more how do i word this because i'm not familiar in this so i don't want to speak in a way that's untrue but some people do respond more to numbers and how do you think it's how do you think you have a conversation with a person like that without dismissing the importance of the emotional and personal connections? I guess for I think, me with people, I usually ask less about the numbers. I ask, well, what do you I, I come through it if they choose to try and go analytical, I then approach scientific hypo, hypothesis it's like, well, what are we trying to prove? And then what is the quote unquote experiment that proves that? And then together we kind of look up the stats that have the context of our, our variables. Like we don't say it like that, but that's 
I, I guess I problem yes. solve with them in the moment to try and address the specific issue, not just broad Facebook comment, Twitter comment yes. stuff. <laughs> that That's exactly what I've done in the past of like, what, what is it that you're trying to understand? Like what I try to find a, a non, um, you know, if you, if you're too, you don't want to put people on the defensive immediately, but I try to get to like, what is it you're trying to, what, what would convince you that what I just said is true? Basically, like what evidence would be sufficient? Because I, I think sometimes if somebody genuinely is like wanting like, hey, like you're saying that, I don't know, um, Latin, Latinx people are more likely to be fired for X, Y, and Z reason. If somebody is genuinely interested in like, oh, where did, you know, is that actually true? Like, where, where did you hear that? That's one thing. But if it's, well, I don't believe that. And it's, and it's right. coming from a position of defensiveness. You can very easily be like, well, what, what statistics would convince you that that is true? Like, what, would it have to, what yeah. source would convince you? And I think if it's not coming from a place of good faith, often that becomes pretty quick, apparent quickly. And I'm like, I, you know, to quote the Bible, I don't, I don't cast my pearls with swine. So like, I'm not going to spend my um, time trying to convince somebody who can't be convinced. Yeah, you pretty much said what I said. I, I look at your response to something I say, and I'll be like, is this an instance where I should mind my Black business <laughs> and, and just not even engage with you anymore? Because the thing is, I don't got time trying to convince somebody who is giving me Jim Crow nephew energy um, that what my experiences is, is in factual fact. Sorry. And actually, I want just to circle back on the question about statistics. And I actually, I'm loving how this conversation is evolving because we're kind of getting into like how to have a conversation, <laughs> well, like how to be like what is persuasive, and like getting into like the nature of how people even change their minds on things. But anyway, um, the question Jess had up earlier was about like would a collection of essays be a better approach and a book that comes to mind to me that I think did take that approach was disability visibility. And I think it does have a very different impact in terms of like the kind of um, like what you walk away from the book with, because like, I think what I walked away from that book with was just an overwhelming sense of like how little I've really engaged with ableism and how little I've really engaged with like the totality of the human experience around being disabled. Um, so I just think it would create it would be a very different book, I think, if it was a collection of essays. Not neither better nor worse. It I think it would though be fundamentally different if it was um if Jess just highlighted the there's always gonna be a group you can't convince. And obviously, uh Mara, you were mentioning this too. And the funny thing about that is the groups that you can't convince, no matter how many numbers you show them, is because of their personal experiences. And I'm like, don't you see the irony? That you're like, N well, no, that's that's just not how it is, though, so, because I, well, I, and it turns into them framing things from their perspective, and you're like, so you don't care about the numbers then, because I just showed it all to you. So I think it's it's good to point out, obviously, because again, like like I said, we all start in a certain bubble, and then as you get older, I think you have to be bursting your own bubble a little bit and see the world how it is. Um, and understand that you're going to have your perspective and you have your background that you can bring to the table, but also that there are other people with different perspectives and different backgrounds. But when you prioritize your own experiences over those statistics, like um, Gregory was saying, the statistics show if you really want to look at it. But when you're prioritizing your experiences and it, it, it doesn't matter how much you insist that you're logic based at that point, you, you actually aren't. Yeah, it kind of reminds yeah, me. Yeah, just remember that those about, stats oh. came from human lives. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm I mean, it's, this isn't like, I don't want to get in the weeds of it, but like something that at least on Twitter really showed the lack of intersectional solidarity and womenhood was like what happened at the Oscars surrounding, you know, Will Smith and his wife. Like the difference in cultural responses was was vast. And even in my own friend group, I had a friend who could not get off this one part of the conversation. Like this part's boring to me. I want to talk about this part. And I couldn't get them to talk about a different part of it because they were so stuck on it. And one of the reasons I could connect to it, even though I'm not a black woman, is 
I have trichotillomania. And I'm like, dude, if someone's making fun of my hair, I get so small. Like I become such a tiny ball because of that. So I can't imagine what she's mm-hmm. going through because it's actually an immuno disease. Like, I don't want to talk about if he should or shouldn't have slapped someone. That is such a boring conversation to me. I want to talk about mm-hmm. the other half of this conversation. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't well, get them there because it wasn't it, flashy. And the part of the conversation of like <laughs> the whole thing, we uh, we could have a whole video about that particular yeah. event, we'll call it. But the fact that people are blaming her is the part that I'm like, are you serious? You're blaming her because she rolled her eyes. Are you kidding me? That doesn't. No, they're blaming no. her for who she had an entanglement with. Yeah, they're and that blaming... right there. Right. Should like, show you something. Rolling up yep. her eyes is somehow meaning that the man in her life is no longer responsible for his actions, that she somehow pushed him into that, that it's her fault. Like, it's like, no, just keep it. But I'm just like, yeah. I I just wanted to bring it up because that just was like such a recent moment of like, you can really see even liberal white women just like putting their foot in their mouth, like on the internet. No, that's, that's what liberal, that's what, that's what we live to do. But I think one thing (laughs) that I, I try to challenge myself about is when I'm being called in, not called out, when I'm being called in by somebody from a marginalized identity, why is my response that I don't want to believe what they're saying? And I think like, that often gives me an opportunity to be introspective and say like, ooh, because that is challenging this, this, and this. But it's really like, I don't, I certainly do not do that perfectly. Um, I certainly don't do that all the time. But like, (laughs) it's also a lot of like, it's a lot of work to, to do that emotionally. And I don't expect people who are already in like a, a marginalized position to have to, to be able to do that work all the time or to have to do it. And like, I just think, I don't know. I try to keep in my, my mind that realizing that you are wrong about things is really hard on the, 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 like, I mean, Brie could probably tell us all about this as a therapist. Like I think even just like on a psychological and like mental processing level, it's really hard for us to integrate and like internalize that we're like fundamentally wrong about things and Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, i i'm so embarrassed about how i used to view things and i i think that there are some people that they're like i went to school i learned what i needed to learn and now i'm all done (laughs) and i think to your point mara we have to constantly be reassessing and learning new information especially because a lot of times our jobs, depending on what, you know, everybody's got a different job, a different amount of work and things like that. Our jobs don't always uh, facilitate learning about our society. They, a lot of times are very specific, you know, like if you're an accountant, your job obviously isn't going to encourage you to look at the outside world. And uh, as as a member, as a, a committee lead of the finance DNI committee at my workplace, I can tell you that that is not always the case for accountants. But that's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, but I think also something that this book highlights is if you're in a position where you're trying to feed your child, you're trying to feed yourself, you're trying to find a place to work, a place to live you are not going to have the time more than likely to be the one to represent the issues that your community is facing. So there has to be people outside the community that are looking at what's happening. And, and I I think somebody mentioned this way, way, way earlier, not see themselves as like a savior, not seeing themselves as like, aren't I amazing for helping these poor people, but recognizing that this is something that as far as like Mara, you're talking about being introspective. I think a lot of people don't want to feel guilty for their uh, comfort. And it's not, I, I don't know why we have turned the word guilt into such a uh, almost like societal buzzword because I think there's a difference. It's like we need a different word because that's kind of empathy is recognizing when somebody's situation is different from your own and then feeling something as a result. And instead people want to block that off as like, I shouldn't be made to feel guilty for, and I don't think that's the right conversation I think we should more often look at instead of, okay, who cares that you, you're, you don't, you don't have to even, that's the privilege of it. You don't have to look and 
it'd be better if we maybe did. I don't know if I'm making any sense. I feel like I'm going in a thousand different directions right now. No, 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 no. no. It's something um, one of my best friends said, because we were trying to get our chat under control. And like one of my friends was like, how do I, as a white woman, talk to other white people at my workplace about like these things when like they culturally can't relate, but they want to have strong opinions? Because that's what the internet has done, right? Is we all want to have <laughs> strong opinions. And like, sh this is not my original thought, but she said something that I now like am actively using in my life is like, I think there has to be some acknowledgement of the lack of knowledge experience. And the most effective way to do so is minimize passing strong judgment or wrongness. If the conversation is about an experience you can't relate to in general, I think participation should be full of questions and exploration and less hard stance judgments of one side or the other. I think that's just really true, especially in the situation with Will and his wife, like, I, I do not know what it's like to be a black woman. I hear a lot of my black friends talk about their relationship to hair and how messy that is and how in the culture and even in this book, there's a whole chapter on relationships. It's, it's also biblical. Yeah. A lot of black folks are Christian. And in the Bible, it says your hair is your glory. So yeah. to say things like that, you know, um, <clears throat> not going to go into that. I also have a part of me has a hard time talking about Will Smith and Jada in mixed company. So I will say that. Um, I think what uh, y'all three were just talking about, excluding Jess, because Jess didn't say anything in this moment, um, is that I wanted to read something from the book. It says, real feminism, if such a thing can be defined, isn't going to be found in replicating racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, or classist norms. But we are all human, all flawed in our ways, and perhaps most importantly, none of us are immune to the environment that surrounds us. A good all, um, a good statement for understanding that people, you're there. You're not gonna. I think this ties to what I obviously tied to what Angela was saying about asking the questions of the experiences you're not familiar with. I think. Do you all think too? Like, this is a strange question, but obviously people are very swayed by, by what their parents have told them, and. Do you, well, uh, never mind. I feel like I'm going to, I would go into like a completely different conversation that probably wouldn't be beneficial or quite on topic. <laughs> um, a favorite chapter. I have, I have a favorite moment. It's on page, I think 93 um, about respectability. Um, it's kind of, it's a whole paragraph, but this part, do you mind if I read it? Is that... <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, it says the emotional labor required to be respectable, to never ruffle anyone's feathers, to not get angry enough to challenge much, less confront those who might have harmed you is incredibly onerous precisely because it's so dehumanizing. Respectability requires not just a stiff upper lip, but a burying of yourself inside your own flesh in order to be able to maintain the necessary facade. It requires erasing your memory of how it felt to be hungry, cold, scared, and so on until all that is left is a placid surface to mask the raging maelstrom underneath. We talk about stress and illness, but the stress of respectability is unparalleled. You muffle yourself over and over until the screaming is in your veins, in your high blood pressure and lower life expectancy. And then as you look around, you realize that you didn't even get the respect, the validation or the comfort that you thought was waiting on the other side. You've pulled away from the messy, loud, emotional spaces that represent the less respectable side of you and your culture. But at what cost? I think that was my favorite moment in the whole book was that paragraph. Because a lot of this, too, is about. Uh, as far as her personal experiences, people telling her to be a certain way, telling her to be a certain kind of lady, telling her, well, you have to behave this way. And so much so much of how people are told to behave uh, is very much rooted in our views of professionalism and things like that. And just this idea that if you're going to speak on something that is enraging, it makes sense that there is some rage when you're speaking about it and to expect people to just like calmly and like politely express like, doesn't it bother you when women are so hungry that they can't, you know, X, Y, Z, or you can't expect people who have been in that position to always like, why, why would we expect people to be nice about it? It's because we want to put, well, never mind. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and perceive what everybody wants. <laughs> hey, it'd be like that. I have one more quote because that's me. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Because I think it really wraps up of why we started talking about a whole plethora of different things that affects feminism. Um, 29% into the book, the ebook, um, it says uh, feminists need a more realistic understanding of the complex nature of patriarchal influences on marginalized communities. Just keep that in mind. I also want people to know if you go to my Goodreads, I am right now making all my notes visible. <laughs> um, and it and I also have very key points of like on page such and such and um, how to be anti-racist will tell you how the connections were made. So if you're interested in that, not, not that you have to, but um, if anyone was interested That's just such a good resource. in that so uh, connection. Much. I'll say that when um, I was searching Brie to see if we're friends on Goodreads, and I'm not sure that we are, so I'll fix that. Um, one thing that this this uh, book, in conjunction with reading Bad Fat Black Girls... I was like, add me, but I was muted. Yeah. <laughs> I will. Don't, you know, look for the request coming here in a minute. Um, this, in conjunction with Bad Fat Black Girls, it really made me think about the way that Black women's sexuality is policed and, like, on a deeper level. I'd read a little bit about that when I was doing a paper about Beyonce and, like, talking about perceptions of her sexuality and kind of, like, how she portrays that in her work. But, um, the, so the all that to say, the chapter that I really enjoyed was of fast-tailed girls and freedom. Um, because I just think that, especially as a white feminist, that was an area and like continues to be an area that I can learn about more and think about more because I think that there are specific kind of like valences to the way that black women are expected to present their bodies in society that have to do with sexuality. And it's not just, it's not just policing from like the white communities. I think part of what this was getting into is sort of like the, um, the pressures like even between like maybe even generations about like how young black girls are supposed to express their sexuality and what isn't isn't acceptable. I think that also ties into me and Jess have been talking a lot recently about purity culture within the church. Um, so like thinking about that in terms of like kind of like the black Christian experience in America, et cetera. Anyway, all that to say, I really that chapter made me kind of like mull on all of those topics in a way that um, I hadn't before. So I, I particularly enjoyed that chapter. I don't know if I have a favorite moment or chapter. I have like different things that stick out to me and we've already talked about most of the ones. I think the one that just like, it's still like this one point where I'm just still so baffled that people cannot all agree that this is an okay thing that our government does and like how bad our welfare stuff is now. Like how can we not all agree that all families and children should have access to food? Like how is that a, how is that a debate? Like I don't understand it. Like I, I get it at a higher level, lobbyist, capitalism, whatever, but I just mean like on a human level, I don't know how that has become so racially divided because there is a large community of white poor people who also need those welfare things. And it kind of goes back to evicted that we talked about at the beginning, but it's just, yeah. That stat, that <laughs> the percentage that is actually fraudulent is so low. And yet that's the perception of, oh, they're just trying to cheat the system and get what they can, which is frustrating and they already have so little so i guess it just it's it's really weird how propaganda has really warped the average person's perception of what a poor person's going through like i just and why does anybody like the right to eat yeah i mean when i think about all of that it just like really gets me to add another, way. An but, another like, how oh no 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 go go for it brie i was just saying another book just, just throwing it out there. <laughs> the shock doctrine. You're welcome. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. Like the shock doctrine had me in tears. I was in Ukraine, angry. I was just walking around, my headphones on, piss. Um, when we were talking about capitalism and how capitalism targets people in areas that have experienced natural disasters. Oh. And then they had a whole section about like Louisiana from New Orleans. If no one don't know that, I'm also a Katrina survivor. So it's like, whew, piss me off. So that's another book recommendation. My voice is going away for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> 
You and Jess um, can have a party. <laughs> to add to what Mara was saying about the aspects of like sexuality and things that the they mention in the book the percentage of people that just inherently the percentage of people that perceive young black girls as older than white girls of the same age and then that contributes to this like there can't be innocence in that child because they see them as older and therefore like almost should know better that which that's just gross language. and then in some ways has to retroactively make them less innocent because you have to have conversations with your kids about this is how you will be perceived and if you don't act x y and z way this year is some side effects like it's horrible but going also, yeah, back to i don't that. have time i was just saying what y'all two just said goes back to what i'm saying i don't have energy for jim crow nephews and nieces in the world yep yeah the um but with the I mean, you can see that with um, like when there's been murders or like police brutality against young black children, how they're usually, how they're presented in the media. And it's like 15, like why are you saying that this man or woman, like, you know, they're usually like teenagers. And I was like, oh, well, she looked, she was intimate. It's like, it's a 16 year old just because she maybe weighs more than you. Like I've just seen perceptions of like, they didn't look like a child or the way they talk about them in the media. Well, and then um, we age down white people. Like how many times did we hear yeah. Trump's kids being talked about as if they were younger than me? And I'm just like, excuse me. We talk about his children as if they're like in high school and like fresh into college. I'm like, these are grown ass adults. <laughs> and then who, it's sort of on the know. opposite end in hood feminism, she's very passionate about helping the elderly and not dismissing oh, yeah. them and things like that. And, then we always constantly hear that people who are black look younger when they're older. So basically they're perpetually in the state of like, you're an adult who has everything under your control and anything that happens to you is your fault because you should have known better. <laughs> like, and she talks about there should be nothing I wrong remember being 16 in this. Go ahead, sorry. No, I I don't even know what's happening. The, the dang... Uh, Boost mobile service that God is ruining my life. Um, I remember being 16 and this man was like, uh, he had to be, I don't know, in his 30s trying to holla at me. And I'm like, sir, I'm 16. He's like, oh, you look like you're like grown with kids. 16? Yeah, I grown was called from 15 on on my And I don't know how many state. times people come up to me and assume that I have that. Are the gentrification calls. section. Yeah, no, I you was know, I, I, I was just I walking okay, down the street next. in the suburb of Ohio. I was wearing I white corduroys and I have a very big butt, so maybe that was it. But like I don't understand because I'm also very white. Like I don't understand why they were cat calling me. I don't know. But a thing that mm -hmm. you brought up, L, that reminded me something in the book was the gentrification section. And like living in Boston and visually seeing gentrification in real time, kind of actually being a part of it almost. Like, I never thought of the old community aspect of it, how they are losing their community and everything's changing. So that right. was also something that stuck with me. Like the elderly have their routines and their patterns and then that you're upending all of that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Sorry, Gregory's comment. <laughs> well, and I think yeah. we definitely see this when like we're talking about um, people who perpetuate like sexual assaults. It feels like mm -hmm. until they're 30, they're just a kid. Um, so You don't want to ruin his future. Um, <laughs> well, again, everything before. He already ruined someone else's future. So like, or, why yeah. should he get a pass? What's his name? Kavanaugh. It's like, oh, he was just a boy. He was just having fun. Also, I mean, sorry, <clears throat> this could be a whole other... I'll just mention the difference between Kavanaugh's performance in front of the Senate committee versus what we have recently seen is... Uh, Market. <laughs> Can I just say too? I've seen comments that are like, "She looks so angry." I'm like, "She's sitting there calmly. How much? She, how much composure does she have to have?" <laughs> and if she was angry, so yeah, because exactly. Ted Cruz was out of order. Uh, All yeah. of them was or, out of order. Or mm -hmm. so if she was her, angry, choose that violence. I'm here for you, sis. <laughs> choose when, it. When, when she was asked, well, she's been asked about a lot of those things over and over and over again. But 
she was asked about a specific case and she like didn't remember the details and they straight up were like i don't believe you i think you know and you just don't want to say and they like, moved on and you're like it's okay <laughs> I don't understand. You clearly have your own bias in this. I mean, it's obvious they have their own bias, but to vocalize it so openly. I assume the only way she got through that was just like going into a Zen place internally and just being like, this is just the last like performance I have to execute before I get, I get that robe. I get my collar and just don't have to listen to these idiots ever again. It was really, I don't want to say entertaining to make a joke out of it, but when when Ted Cruz kept going and then they were like, your time is up. And then he kept going and she's just sitting there like looking back and forth at them. Sorry. It was, it's not actually no. funny. It's one of those things where it's like, so Parks and Rec, was that actually fiction or? <laughs> yeah. None um, of those women were qualified to ask her any questions. It's just like, please. Honestly. My, my darkest days, I, I think of the TikTok that says that I can't let Mitch McConnell outlive me. So that's yes. what keeps me that sound i think of it often i'm like so get your ass up and let's go and i'm like yes i'm not gonna let him outlive me i do want to uh mention just on the topic of like women being blamed how they're perceived for the actions of others um know my name by chanel miller um another one although yeah oh my gosh does that make i mean it's a difficult book to read you could probably figure out being a sexual assault victim uh her going through what has occurred yeah i'm definitely so, not reading that yeah that one <laughs> seems like it's too much for me it's, but i've heard it's great as like at at the very least even heard it's wonderful before, yes the her victim statement is that what it's called um at the end and she reads oh my gosh i'm getting choked up even thinking about it she reads it and she gets choked up reading it again in the book and it's like ugh, i almost cried so many times in that book oh my gosh um to yeah. jessica's point some books about, is just not for you yeah yeah I, i'm with you on that brie um to jessica's point i can't say how i know this but professionally i can tell you that i had an opportunity to see the um who is on medicaid roles for a certain area uh and it makes me so angry <laughs> whenever I hear people like talking about people abusing Medicaid or like who is on Medicaid because the overwhelming majority of people who are on Medicaid are children, pregnant women or old people. And if you look at the distribution, at least in the area that I was looking at, it, it is very equally divided between races. Like it's so when people talk about how like you need to have like a requirement to work for Medicaid, I'm like, do you want this five year old? <laughs> to be working a part-time job sir yes is that yeah. what you're suggesting yes. also it requires That's food to apply to a job to get the job like you can't just like suddenly have a job and we don't have a system where if someone needs a job and is willing to work they can automatically get one from the government that's not a that's not a service the government has provided <laughs> no i hate um i had another pinned comment um that i thought this was interesting. They said, how do you take care of yourselves and stay sane reading these books? I um, have, I don't know. I think they've, oh, did my, did my just go <laughs> oh, I'm there, ghetto. Oh, no. um, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. You're frozen, oh. but we can hear you. Oh, that's okay. Right um, um, I don't know. I think they still make me mad, but I just, I don't know. I don't have, like, I don't, I don't take care of myself, I guess. I don't have a good answer. I just keep reading them and just getting mad. And I'm like, but I want to know things. So I just keep reading it. And I just vent to people in group chats and, 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 and have these discussions with y'all. <laughs> Something that helps me um, is I, I jokingly said, you just have, then just go look at some pictures of puppies, but um, there are also good news things you can read where they tell uplifting stories. They tell stories of people being kind to one another, taking care of each other, um, so that you're not constantly only taking in the negativity, recognizing like there's a lot of people because at the end of the day, I think a lot of times happy stories don't sell. So you're not going to see those. You're going to see people arguing. You're going to see people who are likely underqualified talking about issues and so you kind of almost have to 
to go out of your way to see the nice things and go out of your way to try to dig into the root of issues and understand other perspectives. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that's sort of my, like how I take care of myself is I like, I look at all these terrible things and then I also send myself pictures of puppies every day. I send myself pictures of dogs and then I try to look at happy stories too of human beings. But that's, I guess my answer, although Brie might be able to elaborate on this a little more. I think <laughs> I definitely, I don't think that I'm, I'm the expert here whatsoever. I don't take care of myself. That's, <laughs> I got a PhD. That's the opposite of taking care of yourself. That's like, it's not good. Um, I think the, the what I do if I get really sad or depressed or feel very motivated by a book because of anger is I actually try and do little things in my community to make me feel more a part of like my surroundings. Like, like, I don't know. I, I don't know how it is for you guys, but in a city, there are certain people who are at certain locations every day at the same time. And most of the time you just walk past each other and you don't interact. But like, I guess some days I'll choose to say hi and talk to this person who is a part of like my surroundings all the time, especially at work. You know, there's always those um, unseen workers that no one talks to, you know, the janitors, security guards, everything. I'll like actually care about things outside of my economic bubble, my social bubble and like I don't know, engage with my community and remind myself that like there are people here and I should, I don't know, I think a lot of what I've been realizing as I've read nonfiction and fiction this past couple months is a lot of the problems stem from us not caring about getting through things together. And that was a big thing in braiding sweetgrass is like, we need to come together as like a community and stuff. And it's like, well, there's no big solution to get there, but I can at least not keep isolating myself and like try these tiny things, but it's, I don't know. No, it, that's it, good. <laughs> taking their not your knowledge and then trying to actually apply it because there's some things that make you feel completely helpless and you're like I have no idea how I can do anything to right this wrong that I just was informing myself of but little things like that and even if it's like checking out a charity that maybe or I know charities don't solve everything like so obviously voting and things like that are important too but I think there's not to say like well I saw this and I voted and I did my part like you have to kind of consistently be working toward it but it does I mean kindness feels good it it does feel good so that's a great point of just trying to spread that kindness to other people yeah. like it's not making big waves or solutions but it, it does make me feel better and if everybody did it it would certainly help well, like I just always think about you know when I'm having a bad day if someone did just say hi and smiled at me even if that was it I would have been like oh that's okay unless it was like a creepy smile we all know like the smiles we don't want but like Hey, take your headphones out. Hey, I'm trying to talk to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just like a casual acknowledgement that we're two people on this earth and everything's on fire, but today's not the worst. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just... um, I've. Oh, no, no, no. Go ahead, Brad. I've found joy in being petty as I get older. <laughs> <laughs> the group chat. Somebody, I think, mentioned it. Just Sorry, so I, can I, I can't always be like, oh, kumbaya, even as a therapist. Like, no, I've found mm -hmm. being petty to just really um, be enjoyment. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody comes for me, I'm coming for you, your edges, your family, your ancestors. I'm coming. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I don't always come. But if I got the energy, I'm coming because I feel yeah. like I've been so palatable and trying to be the good black girl. That's garbage. Mm -hmm. It died. It probably died when I turned 30. <laughs> it yeah. just went in the garbage can somewhere. So I just like to embrace a little bit of violence um, is how I live my life. I agree. Uh, there, So on Gilmore Girls, one of the characters talks about how like she's gotten to a point where she knows she can never please her mother. So rather than like getting stressed about it, she just purpose, she makes it a game that every time they interact, she sees how many times she can make her mad. And like the more points she gets, the better. Uh, and I've, I've taken that approach with several people in my life. And it is a very like, uh, it's a good way to reframe it so that you can just enjoy people's you know, awfulness it's of like exhausting yeah. to try to work yeah. against something sometimes when you know yeah. there's no why. Mm. So you're gonna give me yeah. that, I'm gonna give you that this. Don't be surprised when I snap yeah. back at you. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And I think it's, it's nice. A, yeah, a, I just feel like, you know, it's important. Yeah. It, it's I think also it's nice. A, sorry. 
Or I was just going to uh, say, just... like, as an ally to people, like, so my siblings trans and some of my best friends are black and they get exhausted in the group chat when they're the one person there who has to do the thing. So when I've read nonfiction, I've talked to them, if I can, if I can tell they're having a tired day and they don't want to deal with that ignorant dude in the chat who is well-meaning, but is the, well, actually, it's like, oh my God, just shut up. You're like, when you do have the energy to help other people, it feels like worth it that you went through that rage to like mm -hmm. help take some of the burden, help support someone who's normally like the only one shouting, my pronouns are this, like, oh my gosh, why can't you get this? You know, this dog's pronouns, like get over this. Like yeah. <laughs> well, and I, yeah, I was, the thing I was going to say is I try to, whenever I get overwhelmed, I try to focus on like what the human, so human brains are not evolved to deal with the amount of information we have and to process the amount of cruelty, unkindness, just sadness in the world, like our brains cannot handle it. So if I'm feeling overwhelmed, I really try to take a step back and like narrow what I have control over in my life, like and focus on like doing one person's worth of kindness for the day. And sometimes that's donating to something. Sometimes that's having these kinds of discussions. Like we're all lucky enough to have some level of a platform. So like we can facilitate having these conversations. Like that's something that I can control. I can control, like I mentioned, I'm on the DNI committee. And when I tell you the level of microaggressions that is constantly on display. So that is, that's my petty area is I really enjoy, um, professionally and professionally speak putting some of these vps in their place of like when you said that this is what i heard and i would worry that some of our coworkers who are also a part of that marginalized identity would not <laughs> would not hear ba 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 so like i don't know i think really focusing on things you can control and like finding areas in your world where you can try to make a small difference that is like the number one way that i think you can like avoid falling into the abyss because like none of us can change the world by very few people are ever in a position where they have the opportunity to like truly change the world but all you can do is try to like have your little teeny tiny pickaxe and like see if you can chip away <laughs> at the little tiny rock that you have in front of you and that's like honestly all you can control I think the save it for the group chat um or I, I don't remember the exact uh comment something about a group chat oh there's I rant to my friends and sisters it's so helpful. It's so helpful to have that person. Yeah. And I not so I think society now with social media encourages people to always get their like snark out on Twitter. And sometimes that's helpful, but sometimes it can cause more stress. Sometimes it is helpful to just go be snarky with people that know you that's not going to turn into a giant argument or maybe people don't get your humor or don't understand. Like they just see that one thing and they frame your entire existence around that one thing um so yeah the group chats you know you can be like what the heck is this person why ah, and then you just get it all out there very amazing. that's a good this is a good point i'm a very like manageable goals oriented person so that's probably why i lean towards this too like i don't like to make goals that i can't achieve like i know some people thrive on that like i'll never get to that and for me i yeah it depresses you <laughs> <sighs> I don't know. I just, I need at least to have little goals along the way <laughs> to feel accomplished. That's why I started YouTube. I needed the accomplishment feeling of I've made a thing. Here's a thing I did. Everything else is not happening, but I made a little thing. <laughs> That's kind of why I started YouTube too. If I'm not working on slash towards something, I'm just like, my life has no meaning, which is so dumb. <laughs> But I mean, it's why people play like video games, right? Like they yeah. want to level up and they can do that. In oh the my gosh, I can't even tell you. As, as, I don't know about the rest of you, but I uh, love video games. And sometimes I'm like, okay, but I just, I want to get that like 0.3% higher on my stupid weapon in Ghost of Tsushima <laughs> Legends. So can I reroll a thousand times until maybe I get it? It went up by 0.1. Okay, that's an improvement. I'm excited. Like, yes, Angela, just to say, I do love video games and I do <laughs> like accomplishing things, even if it doesn't matter at all in the grand scheme of life. There's a video game for everyone. Like, I mean, <laughs> Jess has The Sims. Like, right now, 20. Do you guys remember the game 2048 back from like 2014 or 15? It's the one with the squares that you had to keep adding them. That game's on my phone again and it's not okay. <laughs> like, I'm mm -hmm. going. It was like, it wasn't a Wordle type sensation, but everyone at my college was playing it nonstop in class. <laughs> I refuse to play Wordle. 
Refuse. I have That's not okay. played Wordle. I, I support you. <laughs> Is anyone in the chat playing Elden Ring? I mean, it's like... No. No. Elden Ring makes me feel good about my life, because I know I cannot be worse in real life than I would be playing Elden Ring. Like, Andrew plays, and I look, it looks confusing to me, so... Yeah, I've been maybe. watching. A I Twitch just feel like play I'm, I'm, huh? I was just saying I watched uh, them on a Twitch play. I'm a low. I'm a Candy Crush girl. Uh, I just nice. started on. Candy I'm a Candy Crush, Crush girl. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm on level one thousand. I just hit level one thousand. I'm pretty proud of myself. Congratulations. <laughs> that game has been going so Thank long. You. Like my mom's been playing it for like a decade. I feel like it's been going. I, I love Candy Crush. Oh, Tetris is great. Tetris was my first. I'm depressed. What can I do? Game. Tetris and yeah. Minesweeper. Those are the ones. There's a version of Tetris called, I think, 1010 or 1040, mm-hmm. something like that, that I have on my phone. And that's one of my good, like, just turn my brain off kind of games. Yeah. Jess, yeah. you wanted to quote something from the book, I think. And we started talking about video games. So I'm sorry. Oh, no, I don't think I wanted to try to figure out what I wanted to say. I didn't have a specific quote. Um, but I can't remember what I wanted to say either. So. Sorry. Just <laughs> before we um, get to did, two hours, do you want to tell them about next month's book? Oh yeah, one sec. Sorry. Oh, have y'all chose it? Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't even know y'all chose what? it. She's asking if oh, we chose the book, so we, and we haven't officially told anyone yet. You're here for it live. Oh, nice. I'm excited. I'm gonna read whatever it is. So, I'm. I think I voted for the Ann Applebaum. That's what I voted for. Uh, Sean has read something else by by that author as well. Yeah, I read Iron Curtain from her, and that was really, really, I mean, depressing, but good. I think the one Sean read has a very, like, America-looking cover. Mm. Hold on. Let me look her up. America. America. I also want to read Twilight of Democracy. I've heard that's really good from her. That one you read? Why can't I? You're ready for the anticipation. Yeah, you're, you're, you're. Drumming up our, our we don't know what it is yet. Jess hasn't told us. Yeah. So the question. I was trying to I was trying to open up uh, Discord and I opened up TikTok. Sorry about that. I was Listen, like, oh, where's it coming from? <laughs> I'm just yeah. saying I 100% vote for Red Famine, but if oh if God. something else was chosen, I totally get it. Angela, I don't know what to do. It's like literally tied, so it's been up to Jess and I. And Jess and I actually oh. wanted to read the Gates of Europe. <laughs> uh, so I don't know what to do. I don't, I they're literally like tied. They're literally tied. <laughs> they are tied. What's tied? Gates of Europe and what else? Red, Red Famine. Red Famine. The logic Damn. was that the Gates of Europe seemed like, based off the synopsis, Water. a better, broader intro introduction to the hi- entire history of Ukraine, whereas Red <laughs> Famine is focused <laughs> on a couple decades. Um, that was the logic. Tra- I'll just read both. How about that? Yeah, I already bought. I bought them already because I want to read at least three yeah. of them. I mean, yeah. I have both of them on hold. They'll both come in at the same time. But yeah, awesome. Red Famine gave. I got lots of notes on that. But yeah, whatever y'all read is good. Choose it. Live it up. Jess gets stressed. Jess forgets it's her book club, and she can do what she wants, and no one's paying her. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I I mean to I'm gonna be honest. Um I probably won't be participating with the reading. I'm like stressed out about it. I <laughs> yeah, like, I think that's understandable. I think that's reasonable. Yeah. I'm like stressed out as a person, yeah. black woman who lived in Ukraine, all these things coming out, uh as a Peace Corps volunteer and all that stuff's coming out. It's just I so much that. stuff coming out. Yeah, and I'm also I trying to help the community I uh, lived in. So it's it's a stressful situation. Yeah, I commented in Discord, like, this might be too, like, for me, I'm like, what's topical sometimes for some people too much since it's right happening right now. And I didn't realize there were so many African yeah. students in Ukraine. Um, oh, yeah, so many. Um, side note, moment of happiness. Um, I remember being 28, dating this guy. 
Um, he owned the club and they threw just like the best birthday party for me and all my friends. And they paid for everything. We danced the night away. And um, they were all African students. And then it was me. And I was living my best. <laughs> Yay for happy. Yeah, one of the best birthdays. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like a moment of this little happiness. But yeah. That was so nice. the Dance of Europe, I think, was written in response to tensions in 2015 specifically. So it's not related to now, despite if you like read it, you could <laughs> insert now being like the beginning of the synopsis. Ukraine is currently embroiled in a tense battle with Russia is like the first sentence. But I don't know much yeah. about this author. I just know he's um it, it was he's from Russia. He books, I just put both I of thought. them on hold. Yeah, so. yeah I mean so, this is a this is a good book too. The gates have you read this one as well? No, I, my friends have. They they heard of it. Um, they've they've read it and said it was a good book too. Um, so I'd probably read it slowly along with you. I felt that Red Famine <laughs> did dive into the history, even not even just the I decades. was basing it purely on the title of the book because it said 19 mm-hmm. something, 20 something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can vouch for Ann Applebaum is just like as an interesting, like a really interesting thinker in general. So, like, I mm-hmm. think her her overall work as a thinker and a historian is really great for this region. But yeah, I mean, I love a good, historian. it's not like you're going to have a, yeah, you're, you're not going to go wrong with either. Probably. Um, that's like, what I feel. <laughs> I, told, I truly feel that way. I don't think you will go I'm wrong. Really I think cool. either one, you win that. Yeah. Either one, you're good. So you want to read both. Yeah. We could talk with one, both. And so this yeah. is for May. Damn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. May. So, so I plan to read both. If other people want to read both, we can talk. Even though, yeah, that would be four. I think three ended up being mentioned. What were the two that you are maybe going to read? The Gates of Europe and The Red Famine. Okay, okay. And Just they're both know- about 400 pages. Like oh, They're both almost 400. There's like 385 and 365. Okay. One of the Nine audiobooks there. is nine hours and the other one's 12 i think let me see oh, okay yeah i think red famine has antidotes from personal uh people like uh <laughs> people yeah. god jesus y'all know what i mean interviews or such eyewitnesses <laughs> eyewitnesses thank you mara yeah. why was i struggling Primary on counts. that boat i was i was right there with you thank i you. was struggling <laughs> um 15 hours and 18 hours so yeah they're pretty close to the same Timelines. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And that's for May. There was. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that I don't know if we've answered really the question. Weird. Jess, are we doing both? Am I reading two nonfictions? Are you doing this to me? Jess, Please. choose one. Don't don't live that life. Both. I mean, that's all I'm reading currently. <laughs> nonfiction. My brain doesn't want to read. I mean, you know, you know, you don't obviously don't have to, but <laughs> both. <laughs> the comment, so what's the pick? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I totally get that. She's suffering. Yeah. Is, that, her. is that rude to do both? I mean, I'm just gonna read. Both that's books, not. So like, listen, that's not rude. There's sometimes in my Patreon book club, I'd be like, "Oh, we're reading this because we're reading Bell Hooks this month, all about love." And I'm like, "Oh yeah," and here's another book. <laughs> I, I chew that all the time. I'd be like, "Yeah," and there's another one. Jump in. Well, yeah. Yes, Angela, you'll be fine. <laughs> All right. Well, my request then is that for our next, so we read this in May. My request mm-hmm. is then maybe we discuss it not at the beginning of June, but maybe mid to the end of June to give time. Yeah. To read both. Yeah. I don't want to get into the discussion in my birthday month. Oh. <laughs> Are you a Taurus or a Gemini? I am most definitely a Gemini. Okay, and so you're a May Gemini. I am a May Gemini. That's a good side to be on. That Leanna is a May Gemini too. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. May Gemini. That's me. We'll, we'll push it back. Yeah, good thing I finished exactly. Then you'll have time. Um, but yeah, I already ordered. I ordered another one. I can't remember what. I was like, oh, I might as well just go ahead and get them because I want. But literally, I keep trying to read fiction, and my brain says no. So this can be one. Well. Are you yeah. reading uh, Beyond Good and Evil? No. No. <laughs> I, um, no. I've, no, I haven't, it's not like I read a lot, but I'm currently um, in reading Jesus and John Wayne. 
Oh, that's a good one too. <laughs> Um, so I need to get back to Beyond Good and Evil though too. But but mostly the last couple of days I've like watched an episode of Bridgerton and then gone to sleep and then wake up. <laughs> That's kind of messed up. Yeah. <laughs> good life. But, um, a- another recommendation I was telling the ladies about before we started is the Ukrainian and Russian notebooks and from take Igor. Mara. And it's oh it's- yeah, I've read that. Did you like it? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. It's, I read that. Uh, it's a graphic yeah, novel it. nonfiction. Um, so if you're looking for something a little more quick to get through yeah. or accessible, so yeah, I'll have to check my local used bookstores for all of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure they're in there. Do you have any? Anyone have any final thoughts on hood feminism that they wanted to share, point out, elaborate? Hood on? feminism is a great conversation starter. It is. As proof by this two-hour conversation, and yeah. that's and it was literally most of the conversation, ninety yeah. <laughs> percent of it. Um, yeah, holla at my Goodreads for my notes. That's all mm-hmm. I can say. I don't really know everything I can remember that I did, but yeah, yeah. No, I mean I think it's I think it's a really good version of what it is, and. Yeah, hopefully from this conversation, people have a lot of other recommendations of other places they can go to learn more. And um, yeah, I feel like this was a, I, I feel like this had turned into the nature of like how people change their minds, which I thought that was, I wasn't expecting that, but I enjoyed the conversation, ladies. Dude, the challenge of transferring information and concepts to individuals is so fascinating. It's part of why I want to become like a teacher, because like even just like, translating facts to another individual is so hard yeah i mean yeah i I used to want to teach history i went to school for music and that's what i taught very different you know i don't it's not quite teaching uh concepts (laughs) and teaching ways of thinking versus i mean they're tied together it's just not you well, know, and music has so many different schools of teaching. Like my piano teacher taught me like the memorization one, so I never learned how to read sheet music for like ten years. <laughs> uh, it's from Redbubble. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, we. I don't need to get in a hole. I've thought about doing a video like comparing books to music, and I'm like, no one would care. <laughs> I was, nobody would care if I did that. There'd be like a couple of people like, wow, that's interesting. But. Do it for your patrons. Just make it anyways. <laughs> it would be like a 50 minute long video as to like, this is what aspects of like the violin are kind of like how we take in books. Oh, that sounds so cool. I, I know what you mean. It's a very niche video idea, but it sounds really cool. It'd be very niche. Very yeah. Cool. Um, there's a few people confused. What is the pick for so, May? So, so there's two. One is Red Famine by Anne Apple. Apple bomb. I think it's and technically the game. Apple bomb. Apple bomb. bottom jeans. <laughs> <laughs> I was first. thinking it, but I didn't know someone would say it. <laughs> then the yeah, gates of Europe by Sergei Plop. Sergei something. I don't. I know I'm saying that both. So you don't have to read both. You can read one or the other or both. But I'm planning to read both, and we'll discuss both in the live stream. I'm planning to read both, but I'm going to read The Gates of Europe first. So if I only end up reading one, that's the one I'll end up reading. <laughs> yeah, That's the order in my brain. I'll probably get to it. Plucky. Yes. Thanks um, for the encouragement, friend. <laughs> I mean, I would watch that. I, I'm just letting you know I would watch a 50-minute video of music and books. But I love music a lot. So. <laughs> I just... it. It hurts me when I ask somebody who, this is all I'll say, and then I promise I won't go on about it, but having gone to school, especially as a violinist, going to school for music, like you're around like music snobs, right? And then when you see that same kind of snobbery in reading, and it's so frustrating because I'm like, yeah, I can play probably more advanced things than what Lindsey Sterling is playing, but her music is fun and there's nothing wrong with that if people like it. And if it gets them into like violin, that's awesome. There's no need to stick your nose up at it because it's not Tchaikovsky or whatever. Anyway, sorry. I get well, also, like, that mm-hmm. just gets into the whole, like, artist subjective and how do we determine what is higher yeah. art? Like, it's I just... Know. I agree. As someone who is traditionally, like, played Chopin and stuff like that, I get really annoyed when people get mad at, like, exciting music that people care about. 
I just feel like our planet is dying and there's so much evil and cruelty in the world that if people find something that can give them a brief moment of joy and respite from it, like, I just don't really feel like I want to yeah, tell them exactly. not to do that. Yeah, and tell them it's the wrong, like, it's good that you like books, but that's the wrong book to get joy from. Or that's mm-hmm. the wrong kind of music to get joy from. It just means that you're, like, not as intellectual or as, and you're like, what? This is, ah. So pop music is popular for a reason. It's catchy. And that's its own kind of talent. And I lo- yeah. Yeah. I'm the only one in my house who likes top 40s music, and I get to live in my world of lesser music takes. And I'm just like, I like top 40s. Well, at least top 40s from like 2013. I don't know what I like song pop music. I don't know. Does anybody watch Todd Todd in the Shadows? I really yeah. like his stuff. He's got great mm-hmm. commentary videos. Yeah, I it's about like few albums on repeat. <laughs> yeah, I'll listen to that Adele. Oh my God, song It's so good. That's a great song. I've just been listening to that album since it came out. That's it. <laughs> I haven't listened to like any of the other songs. Just that one. I'll listen to that on repeat. I'm like, I'll listen to this a few times. And then like, I'll try to get ready. And like, <laughs> the song can play five times. And I have to try to get ready really fast while it's playing. And it just like gets me pumped for the day. There's other, there's some music that you listen to. And it's like, you listen to like appreciate and process and things like that. There's some music that just like gets you pumped or gets you excited or makes you feel things. And well, and then like there's some music, like I'm sure you feel this playing music. Like there's some songs that I like listening to, but others I like to play because of the challenge of certain songs and like the fingerings and stuff. Like some things are just like it was a fun line to play. Yeah. There's certain there's certain things that are fun. The physic <laughs> the physical aspects of playing like it's like oh that was a really cool like i don't know how to explain it but if you've played a physical instrument you know when there's been a thing that like that felt so natural to do that and it was the perfect amount of challenge and accomplishment and it's funny what if you don't play the things that people think sound impressive like a tremolo glissando where people are like oh my gosh and you're like it's so easy it's just this and then you slowly go up and people lose their minds over it but then something that's actually like really challenging and they're like, ah, I didn't really like that one. And you're like, that's fine. That's okay. Yeah, like Nocturnes yeah. by Chopin are actually so difficult to play, so but they are so slow and no one understands what's happening. And then I play like a Hungarian dance that I learned when I was in first grade. And it's just like flashy and all over the place. And people are like, what are you doing? You're crossing your hands. It's like, yeah, but it's just these it's the same thing yeah. going. <laughs> like that's, that's Bach, all of which like they're like all really hard to play, but Bach, Sonatas, and Partites, we'll say, uh, are so challenging and they don't always sound it anyway i said sorry I sorry I, ha- I don't get to talk music with people though i did learn <laughs> to play clarinet and that made me really happy Aww. i played clarinet for one year and then wow. i stopped wow we're currently, there for a while. we're currently cleaning some stuff where my violin was my violin's just like on the kitchen table and i think it's been making me like itch to i don't know talk about music and play music and stuff <laughs> Anyway, well, then you can make topic. it a World Hoppers video. I thank you all for joining. <laughs> and <laughs> I hope it wasn't too confusing for May. There's two picks. Um, and then all the books have been mentioned. I do have a list and I don't, I guess I could put it in the description of this or I just can post it on my community tab because it's a long list of books. Um, but this was a wonderful conversation per usual. So Thanks. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Toodles. Bye.